into part three of our storm spotting process where we need to talk about what kind of weather needs to be reported to the National Weather Service. So the items listed here, tornadoes, thunder clouds, wall clouds, hail, wind damage, flooding, estimating wind speeds, water spouts, and high rainfall measurements are all the main ones that we need to know about. And we're going to go more into detail with each one of these as we go through here. There are things that you do not need to report to us as well. Light rainfall, uh, we have ways that you can, if you're, if you're big into measuring rainfall, we have a program called Kokoraz that you can submit your information to each morning, and it's a great way to be able to send in light rainfall reports uh, on a daily basis as opposed to in the, the heat of the moment when there is bad weather coming through. Shelf clouds, we'll talk a little bit more about those, but here's a pretty one that was taken by our neighbor, uh, Tim, uh, by our office at the, the National Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan. You can kind of see the, the long line of cloud across the horizon. We, we can't gauge how bad that storm is based on just that shelf cloud. Looks cool and kind of ominous, but uh, we do not need to get reports of shelf clouds. Lightning as well. We have sensors that we, we use to be able to monitor where lightning strikes are. Thunder as a result of that as well. Uh, we get a lot of people telling us about heavy thunder, but that doesn't uh, play into whether or not we have a severe thunderstorm or not. And then also secondhand and unconfirmed information. So if, you know, if this is directly from you, that's fantastic. Uh, but uh, sometimes rumors can get out of control, and if somebody hasn't taken this training, they might not have as a good of understanding of what kind of things we're looking for. So just some very basics about thunderstorms. And the, the three main things that we look at when we're trying to figure out if there's going to be thunderstorms are moisture, instability, and lift. So the more moisture you have, the more clouds, the more rainfall you can make. So, you know, if you're really dry, you might not have a whole lot of them. So that plays in particularly when we're looking at flash flooding in those types of situations. Instability. So this is just a measurement of how fast air moves up in the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, the more unstable an atmosphere is, the faster storms can build up and go from essentially nothing to just being severe within a matter of minutes. Lift is something to get this all moving. So sometimes it's a cold front, sometimes it's low pressure. It's kind of weird to think of it, but there's air that moves upwards, and a lot of times it gets started by a wedge uh, when there is a contrast in air mass, like cold air pushing into warm air. So those are the three main ingredients that we're always kind of we're trying to get a gauge on what, uh, what levels we're going to have for when storms move through and what those are at for how severe a storm might be. The added ingredient is wind shear to, to be able to have uh, severe thunderstorms as opposed to just regular general thunderstorms. Wind shear is just a change in the wind speeds and direction as you go up from the ground all the way through the top levels of where a thunderstorm might be. So if winds are gradually increasing as you're going up and if they're kind of changing from being southerly at the ground to westerly or northwesterly further up in the, the thunderstorm, that's a good setup for severe thunderstorms or long track uh, thunderstorms as opposed to days where there is no wind shear. So we get different types of thunderstorms depending on what that wind does and also these ingredients here. So based on all that, the, the, the wind shear really helps to give us an idea of if we're going to have a single cell day, is it a, is it a day where just the storm's going to pop up and collapse within uh, like 30 to 60 minutes? Is there a little bit more wind shear where we could have these multi-cell clusters or lines of thunderstorms? This is the most common type of severe weather that we get in Wisconsin. A lot of times the wind shear ends up being in the lower part of the thunderstorm, and that's how we get these uh, clusters or lines of storms that produce severe uh, winds and hail. The the days where all that comes together, where we have wind shear from basically the ground all the way up through the top level of the thunderstorm is when we have supercell thunderstorms. So we get some of our long track tornadoes, extreme hail days uh, when, when those ingredients come together. So this is why all these different ingredients really matter when we're trying to predict what's going to happen with the thunderstorms on that particular day. All right, so hail is pretty easy to be able to observe. So what you do is just grab whatever the biggest hailstones are and take a ruler and measure what the diameter is. So what the, the longest distance is from one edge of the hailstone to the other, and that's what's considered to be the, the hailstone. So you can see 
This was from our April 7th from last year. Uh, quite a bit of hailstones here. Some big ones down by Browntown. Three inch, so baseball sized hail. Two inch would be closer to about the size of an egg you can kind of see there. And uh, we had that by Jackson uh, from last year. So anything bigger than the size of a quarter or one inch in diameter is what we consider to be severe. If you don't have a ruler, you can compare it to different objects. Again, the quarter is a good one to compare it to since that's what we consider to be severe. You can just put it right behind the, the hailstone and see whether or not it's one, one or the other is bigger than the other. Anything going up the scale, you can kind of see a lot of people have golf balls they can compare to or baseballs as well to get a gauge on how big those hailstones are. Most hailstones end up being the size of the pea or a very small ones here. Flooding and heavy rain, some of the things we need to know about are if, if roads are closed or washed out, the, the roads, bridges, or railroads um, particularly. A lot of times we'll have uh, police that find this out because people say that a road has water across it or people can't get across it. The, the flowing versus standing water can make a big difference. The, the moving water can really push cars around and make a, a very bad situation there as opposed to the standing water. Not that standing water is bad or not bad, but the, the flowing water can be a lot worse. Some things like what's being threatened. The water is up to this level of the house and you know it's never reached this area before. It can kind of give you a gauge on how bad that situation might be. Generally, uh, the, the rainfall amounts we're looking at is about one inch of rainfall uh, total in a, in a short amount of time. This could be over a half hour or an hour. Not an instantaneous rate of rainfall, but instead, uh, you know, if you, if you were to measure for a half hour and you get up to a, an inch of actual rainfall, that's when we uh, start to typically want to get reports that, that that rainfall is happening at that level. And we can kind of gauge that against our radar to get an idea of how bad it actually is. If you do like measuring rain, this is the, the best uh, program you can sign up for, cocoraz.org, C-O-C-O-R-A-H-S.org. And we need as many observers as we possibly can get from this program. We want to have a highly detailed map of these rainfall reports. It's very helpful if, uh, you know, if you're a master gardener or if you're just somebody that really likes to keep tab on their garden and uh, your yard and whether or not you need to water it or not. This is a way to keep a detailed database on how much rainfall you should have. Typically in the summer, you need to have about an inch of rainfall per week in order to maintain a, a normal amount of uh, water there or uh, keep it from getting too dry. So what people do is they, they purchase this rain gauge and that's I think about a $45 purchase for a rain gauge like that, but it's high quality, it's the uh, weather service approved rain gauge that people can use to measure up to 11 inches of rainfall. And you just, you can use an app or you can go online and just down, uh, you can just put in your ports one time a day at one o'clock, at uh, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning and uh, do that once a day. There is an option on there to be able to report through Kokoraz as well for heavy rainfall if it's at a kind of an odd or you know, not a normal hour. Our slogan is turn around, don't drown. Uh, we've had a lot of fatalities that have occurred because people try to drive through flooded roadways. They think that uh, the car will stay in touch with the ground with all that water there, but it gets floated like a boat pretty quickly. And once your tires are off the ground, there's not much you can do. So even if you don't drown, you're likely gonna ruin your car. So it's just best not to try to drive through any flooded roadways. Damaging winds this is probably the most common type of Severe weather that you'd be able to relay information to us about. Know that most people tend to overestimate these winds, though, because it can kind of go from where maybe it's not as windy to all of a sudden, poof, these intense winds come in and create a, you know, the trees are blowing around, and it makes it look really dramatic. But some of the we're going to go through some of the guides for what you can use to be able to get a sense of how strong the winds actually are. If a tree falls down, talk about what part of the tree. Is it a tree limb? Did the entire tree get uprooted or uh, busted off at the trunk? That really makes a difference too. And, you know, is it one tree? Is it multiple trees? How many trees are down that's, that's happening there? Rotted tree, there's some of them that can just fall over with a, even a weak gust. And uh, know that most, sometimes you can have winds coming out ahead before the rain even gets there, and that's called outflow. 
So with damaging winds, we have uh, generally three, four different levels of winds. Uh, 30 to 50 miles per hour is when those whole trees are in motion. You might get some small twigs or small branches that are falling out of the trees, but that's not considered to be at a severe level. 50 to 58, you're getting closer. You're, you're probably getting some small uh, tree limbs or branches that are coming down out of the trees. Maybe some dead trees are getting blown over as well. But uh, that's just below what we consider to be severe limits. 58 to 75, uh, starting to get, that's our severe criteria. Larger branches, trees getting knocked over, uh, visible structural damage, you're getting shingles off of people's houses, that kind of stuff. Over 75, that's considered hurricane force. You're, you're starting to get loss of roof if the wind can get underneath it, particularly barns we've seen that with. Uh, trees uprooted, trunks snap. That's what you can kind of expect at 75, 80 miles per hour or higher. It can be uh, a bad situation if you are camping or boating or anything outside with uh, strong winds like this coming through. And the uh, you know, best thing to be is just inside if any of these situations do end up occurring. So the last thing here, uh, shelf clouds. Uh, no need to report this, but it could mark the beginning of strong winds. Uh, the leading edge here would be where that the damaging winds come through. Uh, again, you could have 70 mile per hour winds coming through with a, a storm like this, or it might just be uh, a, a decaying thunderstorm that still has this nice boundary like this that has like 20 mile per hour winds. So you don't have to report that to us. Uh, we, we, we can't gauge whether or not a storm is severe or not based on whether or not it has a shelf cloud.